Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we focus on the emerging fields of data science, machine learning and artificial intelligence. If you'd like to think of data as the new oil, then you can think of our show as the new car talk because we focus on where the data hits the virtual road. And with me on this epic road trip down the information superhighway is Andy Leonard, everybody's favorite data philosopher. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, actually, this weekend, but it will have happened in the past. So hello, future people. Um, <laughs> I will, I'm speaking at... Uh, uh, SQL Saturday Pittsburgh this weekend. That is awesome. And I'm looking forward to that. It'll be my first SQL Saturday I've spoken at. That's your very first. You have now, well, you will have now, by the time the show airs, crossed, I think, officially to the dark side. That's right. That's right. Because <laughs> I never, there was a time I never thought you would catch me dead at a, at a SQL Saturday. And then I went to the one in Richmond. And I think I've been to a couple since. So. Yeah. Once you go down a data path, will it ever dominate your destiny? That is that is so true. <laughs> so welcome. Uh, we have cake. All right. The cake is not a lie. <laughs> Speaking of data, um, there's an article that was uh, released, I think, today. And basically, um, you know CERN, the, the uh, nuclear research facility or whatever they're called uh, yep, out yep. in Switzerland, um, the Large Hadron Collider? Yep. They they have just made 300 terabytes of data from their super colliding experiments free online. Wow. Just think about that. I mean, 300 terabytes of data, like, that's not that long ago that was seen as impossible. Yeah, yeah. So have you downloaded the 300 terabytes yet, Frank? Uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I, uh, I am sorely tempted to. But, I mean, you want to talk about big data. Well, that's a fine example of big data. That's large. Yeah, I can't store. Um, I can't store. You know, I could store one percent of that if I deleted everything else. Um, I could go run the Costco and buy uh, 103 terabyte drives. There, there you go. That might do it. I might have to bump it up a bit because there's not exactly three terabytes on there, so I'd have to get maybe 320 of them. I, I hear that. But that that's actually interesting. So I heard um, so big data. What what constitutes big data has cha changes over time. So um, I think you and I had spoken about offline about uh, this before, where I I had interviewed at a company last summer who was just so fascinated in the fact they have a six terabyte database uh, yes. on premises, and they were so proud of themselves. And um, there were other aspects of the interview that things were going south anyway but then when i pointed out that that's not big data anymore uh yeah. that that would that did not go over well oh well, that's a shame <laughs> trust me i think it's for the best <laughs> um but um there was a, a best definition i heard of big data that is actually somewhat future uh resistant or future proof is uh if you have to worry about where you're going to store it it's big data that's a good definition yeah, I thought so. And it's nice and future-proof because, you know, 300 terabytes. I mean, the iPhone 11 will probably have 300 terabytes of storage, like, built in. <laughs> or, you know, maybe it might be the iPhone 15. Yeah. It'll cost 10 grand. I could see that happening. It could definitely happen, yes. <laughs> that is so true. Well, we're recording this show on September 28, 2017. And um, very honored to uh, to have our guest. Uh, today, Melissa Coates is our guest. Uh, she's a solution architect with Blue Granite in Charlotte, and she specializes in delivering analytics, data warehousing, BI solutions, uh, using on-premises cloud and hybrid technologies. She's formerly a CPA. I did not know that, Melissa, <laughs> and uh, is ridiculously proud to be an IT geek and downright giddy to be a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. I'm reading what Melissa sent me here, and I think it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> when Melissa steps away from the keyboard, you can probably find her hanging out 
uh, with her border collie, paddle boarding, or playing in the garden. And Melissa blogs at sequelcheck.com. Uh, Melissa, welcome to Data Driven. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. And um, so your SQL chick, not to be confused with data chicks, which is a whole other set of ladies. This is true. This is true. Speaking of confusion, if you search for your name on Google, uh, apparently there's a professional wrestler with your with your yes. name. Actually, that's a funny story. So I've been married, oh gosh, my husband always knows, 20 some years now, somewhere between 20 and 25. I always forget. And it changes every year. It's so easy to forget. So early on when I hadn't met all the extended family members, um, I had found a magazine, a Melissa Coates magazine, and, you know, this female bodybuilder, long blonde hair. And so I, I took it to my mother-in-law's house. She kept it. And for the first couple, two, three years, she got the biggest kick of saying, this is Bob's new wife. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it can't can't do that anymore. But it was a fun family joke for a little while. <laughs> that is. That's awesome. Well, we also know that you're um, one of the leaders of CBIG. So why don't you speak some about that? Sure. So the Charlotte BI group has been around now for about seven years, I think, maybe six, somewhere in that range. And so with Rafael Salas, Jason Thomas and Javier Guillen, we formed the group. And so um, it's been it's been fantastic actually to see people meet each other and get a job because they met somebody through the group. So it's not just, hey, I learned something cool tonight. It's it's just it's really cool. So at the moment I am the marketing volunteer. So Usually if there's a, a tweet or something or, or of that nature, the, the uh, meeting invitations and such, I, I send those out. Oh, very cool. So yeah. how long, uh, well, you already said how long the group's been around, but um, so what, what in your mind distinguishes BI from data science? Ooh, good question. So I have a little bit of a hard time with a lot of things you read these days because I, I don't believe BI is just historical reports, right? And that there's this huge division between is predictive analytics only data science and not BI. I mean, it's it's really gray. So So yeah, generally speaking, though, I think of data science as we're invoking mathematical models and algorithms and so forth. You don't necessarily have to write them, of course, but invoking them uh, uh, in some way in order to turn around and generate an output. Whereas in BI, we might write SQL or MDX or DAX, uh, and we might start running a couple algorithms. But you know, generally speaking, I think of it being more your traditional data warehousing and reporting solutions, which are a great companion to a lot of the other more advanced analytics solutions. Interesting. So do you think, though, that that, that gray, already gray line will get even grayer and fuzzier? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so at the moment, I'm very fascinated with uh, data lakes. And so, for instance, there's Azure Data Lake Analytics, and we run what we call uSQL in there, which is already a hybrid of T-SQL and uh, or not T-SQL, but the SQL syntax and C-sharp. And built in already are, you can run a few of the Azure Cognitive Services uh, services <laughs> uh, as part of that U-SQL. So yeah, the, the line is getting, you know, muddier all the time with all these uh, ways to, to more easily run something that was normally in somebody else's backyard, right? Right, right. The walls are coming down in terms of... You know, who's a data person versus who's a academic versus who's a developer. I mean, th those neat little categories and buckets we used to live in are, are starting to degrade. Yeah, good, good point. Although I tell you what, I have so much respect for the people that really, truly do data science. That is some hard stuff um, at 
I uh, have, have just concluded working for a year at Century One, great company, and was working closely with a data scientist there for the last several months. And holy cow, um, what they do is really complex and really hard. It's definitely people who've devoted their life to mathematics. Um, it's definitely for sure. Uh, impressive yeah. to watch them kind of go at things. Yes, yes. So the, the idea of a citizen data scientist um, is really an interesting idea. So it'll be fun to watch the space because I think we're going to see two camps, right? And uh, it was Peter Myers, actually, who presented this idea to SQL Saturday uh, a few months mm. ago. And he called it an applied data scientist versus the full-fledged, hardcore, deep data scientist. And that makes a lot of sense to me. The other thing is that I've heard, too, is that those applied data scientists are also referred to as data engineers. Fair enough. So it'll be interesting to see how these titles and terms will settle down, if they ever indeed do settle down. <laughs> uh, so you used to be a CPA. <laughs> I did. So when I was foolish and young and trying to decide what to major in, I thought, I like money. Why don't I be a CPA? And that was just the dumbest reason ever. <laughs> really, truly. And it was boring. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it was, it was interesting um, for a little while, but I didn't really like doing the same thing every month, every quarter, every year. And I also didn't like the auditing side of things very much. I, I didn't feel, especially being so young, I was early twenties. Right. And, and that, I didn't feel necessarily confident enough to go into a company and talk to people about, I need to review X, Y, Z on as unpopular as you are with that and just handling it really diplomatically, right? That we're not trying to trip you up, right? Right. So, so that was, that was just kind of tough and something that would have been easier, of course, as I, as I'd gotten older, but, uh, and tax accounting, that eh, wasn't really terribly much fun either. So, so yeah, I ended up finding my way more to the data side of things. Interesting. So, you, I mean, obviously you have a strong mathematics background that 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 must have helped uh, ease the transition into data. No, no, no. I, I used to joke that the only reason I passed the CPA exam is because I took the very first one ever where they allowed a calculator. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I couldn't have done it without a calculator because I'm really actually not that strong in math. And a lot of accounting really is knowing how to categorize an asset or a liability and, and debits and credits. And, you know, it's, it's, I, at least I didn't go down the angle where it was a lot of really that hardcore mathematics. So Melissa, uh, being involved in the Charlotte VI group, you obviously have a passion for community. I think that's why you're uh, one of the reasons why you're a data platform MVP. Um, what's your advice for people that are trying to, perhaps bridge the gap between BI and data science? Wow, good question. You could have given me this one ahead of time so I could come up with something decent to tell you. Um, I guess go out there and do something, right? A, a, a project that even if it just mimics reality Somewhat, right? So if I twist that question into the same thing that I've heard for a long time, which is maybe I'm, administ I'm an administrator and I want to get into BI, well, my answer would have been put BI on top of the data that you need to do your day job, right? And so I, I think it's kind of the same thing and um, just figuring out what that right thing to do to get experience is that'll that's worth your time and effort. So um, that's about all, all I can really think of, you know, other than blogging, right? So I love to blog. I always joke that my day job gets in the way of, of my blogging career, right? So, um, and, and I, I kid you not though, I think my last three jobs, solidly, I haven't had a, a single tech question. And what's really interesting about that is I don't always blog about right. incredibly deep or advanced things, right? But it, it kind of gives you that that credibility, even if you do write beginner material uh, sometimes. So, uh, so I think I think blogging is is well uh, worth your time and effort uh, career wise. 
I, I couldn't agree with you anymore. I mean, um, you have an excellent blog, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I've got about, oh, at, at least a hundred uh, uh, things that I want to write that are either half scribbled in one note or something of that, of that nature that uh, I just need to figure out how to carve out more time because I really do love it. Cool. As a fellow um, frequent blogger, I, I appreciate that because uh, a lot of people kind of question, well, what's the need for blogs these days? Because they're not quite what they're the popular as they used to be. But I still think there's a need for for that sort of thing to particularly particularly the beginner material, because that's that's where people get started. Yes, yes. Um, because, yeah, I think a lot of times it's easy to just assume you already know ABC and and I know I'm guilty of that when I write in my blog a lot uh, that it's it's more an intermediate type of type of thing. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And then the question is, have you just written it in some way that's a little bit different than somebody else did, and that gives someone that aha moment, right? Absolutely. You know, the thing that I've I've shared with people who will come up to me at conferences or or user groups and say, you know. When I read this post by you, I really got it. I read all of this other stuff by others, and it didn't really click. And I think I even wrote a post about this once. It's like, well, <laughs> the truth is you probably did learn an awful lot reading those other posts. It just, you know, you didn't finish learning about it. And you know, that kind of laid the foundation. And then I just happened to be the one you read, you know, at the end of the line. And, and then it clicked. And the same could be said for all of those other writers, right? Somebody reads something I wrote and goes, gosh, I don't understand. But they read another post and, oh, yeah, I get it. So it's kind of like the last post you wrote or read. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Very good point. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, you know, obviously we all have different voices on our blogs, but sometimes mm -hmm. just the fact that you might write in more of a casual voice, which I try to do, is makes it help it uh, be more digestible than say MSDN's fantastic, but it's written of course in a very specific, more educational way as opposed right. to conversational. Um, and, and that just being a different way to consume information is, is I That's think a good, a good point. thing. Right, they have editors that make sure you, you talk that way. You write that way, yeah. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> well, um, so uh, you mentioned that you'd, you'd spent a year at SQL Century and you're uh, going to work at Blue Granite. You've worked at Blue Granite in the past. Yes, I spent three years there. And then a, a colleague uh, had let me know that there was this opening at, at Century One. And although I've had a great year, um, I kind of miss doing the client projects and that, so it's, it's funny because the reason I left is I was a little bit tired and worn down. And, and so I've learned a lot about myself where that yeah. threshold of stress really is. And so uh, I found that I just plain miss it. So now that I know things to look out for stress wise and that sort of thing, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to what I, I think I'm a little more comfortable with and also I actually like the fact that there's pressure on me to, to absolutely keep current with what's going on and, and pressure to turn around and deliver an answer or a solution pretty quickly. Well, very cool. Well, so at, uh, at Blue Granite, uh, are you going to be back in uh, consulting? Is that going to be your main focus? Awesome. Yep. Yep. So solution architect is the role, which, yeah, basically means, for the most part, hands-on client delivery work. Um, this particular role, um, I'm not 100% billable. I've got a, a bucket of time over the course of the year where I'm expected to contribute in other ways, right? And, and some of that's just learning new technology and helping pass it along to others in the company, right? Or uh, my involve writing a white paper or some training materials, things of that nature. So that'll be a nice balance. What do you see as the uh, as the future of data science? Where do you see it going? Oh, wow. I, 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 I ask a hard question. I, I, I think it's 
it's going to be part of everything. I mean, you, yeah, it seems like everything I read these days, there's some sort of AI underneath everything, it seems. that. And granted, some of that's marketing yeah. and hype, no question about it. But a, I think that at least being competent in some of the basics is going to be um, certainly certainly more expected of of uh, those of us that are more traditional BI people. So my personal standard is I can have that first conversation with a customer. What's the need? Kind of figure out, is this something that uh, we would go one direction or another? And then pull in the specialist um, that, would, that would really go much deeper and, and do the delivery and so forth. Interesting. So if people were curious about BI, where, what should they look at first? Ah, so I still think, and actually I'm curious if you guys agree with this. I still think if we go back to the Kimball basic books that have been our quote unquote Bible forever, I still think that's important. Now, do we do that kind of dimensional modeling full on solution all the time now? Absolutely not absolutely a, a, a need for that kind of big schema on read type of BI solution. So I, I think all those uh, traditional things that, that we would have said to learn are still applicable to learn, but also things like data lakes and so forth that allow us to do more schema on read, allow us to do POCs faster and learn the data before we turn around and invest the time to build something that's uh, that bigger uh, structure that's going to take us a, a little bit longer, perhaps. So in your opinion, what's the best uh, elevator pitch for a data lake? Ah, okay. An elevator pitch for a data lake. So I would say you've got some data that you need to acquire or ingest in our in our lingo, right? Mm -hmm. And you just need a place to put it. And that'll buy you some time to figure out where's the value in the data, what are you going to do with it, and so forth. That's where you can quite literally point it at a data lake type of structure and drop it in there because you don't have to define tables and columns and data types ahead of time like you would if, say, you were directing that data into SQL Server. And so um, I think it, it has a number of, of, uh, of value propositions, right? So a, a place to land the data, a way to complement your data warehouse with uh, more flexible structures. So at Century One, I worked a lot on a project where we were ingesting some JSON data. And so um, did a lot with the data lake of in, in that area. So um, I don't know if that was an elevator pitch. We just went up a lot of floors, but those are kind of two of the main use cases. No, I mean, it's helpful because it, you hear that term bantered around a lot and data lakes mean slightly different things to, to different people. So I think that's a balanced answer. Good point. Good point. And I did just refer to it from the storage side only, right? And technically speaking, a data lake is not only storage, that flexible storage, but it's also some processing ability, right? And it's usually, uh, you know, distributed processing and, and all that kind of stuff. So so it really is a two-pronged answer if, if we're being technical about it. But yeah, a lot of times we just focus on the storage. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so now we've got a place to store our 300 terabytes of CERN data. There you go. That's more like a great data lake, like a, like Lake Michigan or something. <laughs> <laughs> I was at uh, one of the last build I was at. Uh, they were just announcing kind of an Azure data lake, and um, I walked out to them and said, so how is the fishing in the data lake or something like that? And I don't think the guy got the joke, but. It was a bad oh, joke. Geez. It was a bad joke. <laughs> That's funny. Well, it is a young service, but I've been really impressed with it so far. Um, it it goes it goes way deeper than um, you might expect for as young as it is, and and so I'm really excited about some of the things that are that are coming. Yeah, I think it's not so much. It's a new it's a new service, but it, it's basically built of a lot of older tech. 
Uh, true. They've got some internal systems, yes, that served as the starting point. You're absolutely right. So it's interesting to kind of see how that has merged. And uh, that's one of the exciting things about the, this field right now is that uh, industries, fields, and tool sets that never interact with, interacted with one another are now doing that on a daily basis. I think that's what makes it interesting. Oh, yeah. And, you know, even things like uh, Microsoft Flow or Power Apps right. start making some things easier. I mean, even for a for a business user who's not a hardcore techie, they, they can start using some of those tools. So one of the things I've worried about is as things get easier, you know, it, and, and less centralized, right? It's going to in the the trade-off there is things are going to be running everywhere <laughs> and trying to figure out what's where is is going to inherently become harder with that immense flexibility right with great power comes great responsibility or something like that there you go there you go <laughs> well melissa um one of the questions we like to ask all our guests is uh, how did you find your way into data and we like to phrase it as uh, did data find you or did you find data uh, I think, I think maybe it was a little bit of both. So we talked earlier that I used to be an accountant. So I was the traditional power user, think access databases, the cell jockey. And I got to where I was importing entries into the general ledger, that sort of thing. And I knew some people in the IT department at the university I was working in and a reporting help desk position opened up. So uh, for a little while, I was a web focus support person and trainer, but that didn't last very long because uh, maybe four months in, my boss came to me and they wanted this, this new thing called a data warehouse. And could I figure out what that is and how we could get one? And so thankfully they sent me to a Kimball class and, you know, as they say, the rest is history. So um, from that point on, I've, I've specialized in that area, but yeah, maybe it was just a little bit of both. Interesting. So what's your, while well, you're in between gigs at this moment, but what's your favorite part of your favorite gig that you've had? So it's basically learning. So if I'm not continually learning and getting better at what it is that I do, then I'm not happy. So basically that, that continual pressure to learn is actually what makes me tick. So at Blue Granite that translates into how do customers do things, right? Whether it's the best practice and they're doing it well or not, right? Or, you know, the the way that we're expected to come in and, and solve problems um, from one customer project to another. So so that's what I like the best is is the learning aspect. Very interesting. Cool. So we have three questions that are complete this sentence. When I'm not working, I enjoy point. That would be hanging out with my dog. My my husband accuses me that I like the dog better. So, you know, I'll, I'll just let that statement lie. But when we go paddle boarding on the lake, she rides on the front of the paddle board with me, which gives me some giggles for sure. And uh, there's a dog park near my house that I'm pretty fond of. So, so yeah, we spend some quality time together. I can understand that. I have four dogs myself. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> so is it a data leak, though? Oh, no. <laughs> Frank has been dying to use those sound effects since, uh, since day one. Right. Oh, right. funny, funny. <laughs> oh, I'll have to figure out a way to, to put the paddle board on the lake with a data lake. Uh, yeah, I'll have to think on that one. <laughs> there you go. Uh, sorry, we got derailed there. Uh, so complete this sentence. I think the coolest thing in technology today is blank. So we actually hit on this just a little bit earlier. I think it's all the layers that we're seeing that mask complexity. And so, for instance, just yesterday in Azure, I was setting up a recovery services vault and I told it to back up some VMs on a schedule and it really didn't take me very long. And can you imagine how much is actually going on behind the scenes that I don't have to understand at all in order to make that work? 
Um, so I think that's all really interesting, um, all that masking and, and of course, microservices uh, kind of goes along with that line of thought too. Yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? I mean, the idea that you could, I mean, spinning up a, or installing a new SQL Server on a machine used to be an all day, if not more, affair, you know, installing things, doing things in the right order. Now all you have to do is click, 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 and it may take like three minutes for it to go in the background, but. True. In all fairness, though, you can start with one of those VM images that have SQL Server installed on it, but my my checklist at work for what I do to that machine after I spin it up is still really long. So, right, you know, change, because it's a basically a next, next, next installation. So I want to move the drives. I want to change the service accounts. And so there's still some things to do, but you're right. If, if you're not interested in making it a enterprise level best practices organizational machine, then you don't have to. Right, right. Well, I just meant it, doing have my own development server. Um, oh, sure. I mean, it's just now it's just so easy to do. It's just click, click, click. Or, or not to say nothing about the, the headaches of provisioning new hardware purchases. Good point. I mean, I was giving a talk once to a bunch of students and um, uh, I created a new service, a new virtual server and stuff like that. And they were like, wow, this is taking forever. <laughs> it's like, you know, 90 seconds into it. And I was like, <laughs> I had to do the back in my day thing. I felt so old. <laughs> Yeah, back in the old days, you know, you would shut down the business on Friday afternoon, maybe leave the office an hour or two early, you'd go by the store, you buy a box of parts, and then you'd come in on Saturday and assemble everything, load the OS, and put it through its paces on Sunday. And, you know, Monday morning, like magic, there was a new service up and running. And you I did bet barefoot, you had to go to the store in the snow. Both ways. Yes. Barefoot. <laughs> you had a, we, we didn't have ones and zeros we just That's had right. zeros <laughs> and, we, and you have to we follow used to up carve our own like chips it. out of wood <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely the old days but yeah it's uh it's definitely different and you know when we think about the you know the tech that's here now and i I talked to my kids about it. I'll tell you this story. A few years ago, Stevie Ray was writing a report for school, and he'd seen me working on some book projects, and he said, Dad, I want to use that software you use for the books. So we installed Word. This is, again, a few years ago. And I was teaching him how to use it, how to open files, how to save files and stuff. And I told him, you know, this is a, a picture of a file folder here on the icon. You, you click that, that opens the file. And I said, you click this button here with this icon on it to save it. And he says, what's that? And he'd never seen a floppy. Um, I had to explain to him what a floppy <laughs> disk was. And it's like, you know, I remember a time before floppies, or at least before they were common. You know, when I started, it was that far back. So very interesting, uh, the generations and uh you know, we have Mark Cabadillo was on the show talking about the difference between um, uh, digital immigrants and digital natives. And that's also another divider of generations, I think, in the technological ages. So pretty cool stuff. So we have one more uh, complete this sentence. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to build. Drive me around. So... Here, I here. think about this frequently, you know, somebody rudely changes lanes or, or they're puttering along in the left lane on the highway because gosh, darn it, there is such a thing as left lane highway etiquette. But seriously, I think it's going to be really nice when the machines take care of all of this driving for us humans and everything will be, you know, less accidents, et cetera, et cetera. So I just think it's going to be fascinating. It's going to take us two or three decades, I suppose, but it'll be a fascinating transition to watch. Yeah, every time I have to drive into D.C., I, I just, or across the Beltway, I just cringe. It's like, I'd really much rather have a robot do this. Yep, it'll be interesting. So we have one last question. 
Uh, and that's uh, share something different about yourself. But we do remember remember that it is a family podcast, and we have our uh, clean ratings on iTunes. Oh, darn. All right. Well, I'll keep it PG rated then. <laughs> so I have an obsession with palm trees. I, I truly cannot get enough of them. So I, I suppose that's because I grew up in the Midwest. And so now that I live in North Carolina, there's a few palms that are cold tolerant. And so I have two palm trees right next to my back porch. Nice. And that makes me a very happy girl. Nice. I was going to say, are you far south enough where you could have palm trees? Yeah, just uh, just a couple of uh, two, maybe three kinds are cold tolerant enough, only to zero. So if we had a really wicked, mm. wicked winter, they would be in jeopardy. Uh, and that's zero Fahrenheit, I assume. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, oh, I know. I'm, I'm such an American. Just checking. Just checking. <laughs> well, it does get that cold sometimes. I'm not sure about down in Charlotte. I, I live uh, about four hours north of you here in Farmville, and we get that cold. We get below zero some winters. So. Yeah. Yeah, not too much. We usually see snow maybe mm -hmm. once a year for maybe a day. Um, so, so, yeah. But it, it, it could happen. Another question that's not on the list. I know uh, we sent you some questions ahead of time. Uh, we do this intentionally, Melissa, as questions kind of pop into our mind. We're not trying to trip you up. But it is interesting to get uh, off-the-cuff responses. Um, as we're recording this, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's September 28, <laughs> 2017. There's a big conference going on in Orlando, the, uh, the Ignite Conference this week. Have you been keeping up with that? You know, this has been an incredibly busy week, so I have not kept up significantly, but there are a couple of announcements that I, I've noticed and that I need to circle back and, and uh, check more about uh, Data Factory version 2 with the SSIS engine, I think is a big one. That's probably near and dear to your heart as well. It is, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, so yeah, I need, I need to do a little more homework on, on all the stuff that's been coming out this week. I was just curious if anything had caught your eye or ear. It sounds like those, uh, data integration has, and, um, mine too, as you said. Yep. Yep. I think machine learning has gotten a, a pretty big overhaul, but I haven't had a chance to look into, uh, into what's going on with that. But I think, I think that's pretty big news as well. It'll be interesting to see when this rolls out. They announced uh, 2017 will be, SQL Server 2017 will be ready for general availability. They actually said it's available now, but you can't download it until Monday, October 2nd. So. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, I, I caught a blog the other day that said there's a new predict T-SQL function that's just built in. So, uh, so they're... Uh, integrating you know more than just the r services and the python piece it, it's right. it's coming into t-sql as well with some of those underpinnings oh interesting um yeah yeah fascinating so where can people find out more about you obviously if you do a google search or bing search as the case may be for melissa coates um you're not the bodybuilder I'm not the bodybuilder. Nope, nope. So um, my website's at sequelchick.com. You know, for the first few years I had it, SQL Chicken uh, would always come up before me. But, uh, <laughs> you know, now, now we're probably more neck and neck. <laughs> so, so that's my website. And uh, there's actually a form on the About Me page if, if someone wanted to actually send me an email. That's the way to do it. Um, and then I'm also SQL Chick on, on Twitter. So I'm, I'm pretty hit or miss as far as what I see on Twitter because I'm not a very good multitasker. So I, I, I can't have it up during the day usually unless I'm sitting around waiting for something to run or something of that, that nature. But, uh, but I, I'm on there frequently enough. Great. So uh, we have a deal with our um, subscribers where you can get a free audio book uh, from audible.com. And uh, do you have any audio books that you'd like to recommend that, that you would like to recommend, Melissa? Oh, now, it, are you looking for a technical book or just anything? Ah, whichever. Ah, OK. So what I just finished rereading the other day because I enjoyed the series on Hulu so much 
was The Handmaid's Tale. Ah. And just such an incredible story. So, um, so that, that I suppose would be the pick that's top of mind at the moment. Interesting. The series on Hulu is just as good as the book in a different way. They, they did such a good job. Interesting. I'll have to definitely check that out. Well, very cool. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to meet with us and uh, share with our guests here on Data Driven. We're very honored to, to have you here. And um, I think it was a great show. Frank, what do you think? I think it was an awesome show. Thanks for joining us, Melissa. And Andy, if you could uh, take us out with the address folks need to go to to check out that free book. Absolutely. So we do have an agreement with audible.com. They're a sponsor, and you can learn more at thedatadrivenbook.com. And now we'll let the nice British lady close the show. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen, become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.